Hello everybody, welcome back to IndyCar on the 15th of December. <coughs> There's a couple of items in the news today which I think are important and need a little bit of um, an airing today. So the first one is a report in today's Financial Times. And this is an opinion piece um, written by its political one of its political correspondents. And what's interesting about this uh, particular article is it deals with <coughs> the expectations of a trade deal. And what the Financial Times columnist is saying is that he's predicting that the United Kingdom will sign a trade deal with the European Union this year. But, and I think this is the most important thing about it, the caveat is that it will happen on the European Union's terms and not on the terms dictated by London. Now, the reasons for this are many and various, but uh, he highlighted a few uh, instances of why this will be the case. The first one, of course, is that the United Kingdom and the EU are not the same thing. They're not the same size. The, the UK sort of styles itself as one state, but is in fact made up of four smaller entities, as we know. But <clears throat> not all of those entities wanted to leave Europe, as we know. Uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland both voted quite substantially against leaving the EU. Wales only marginally voting for it. <clears throat> and England now, despite having already voted for Brexit, uh, the sentiments for Brexit now have dropped. More people now think it was a bad idea and think it was a good one. Now, that's not the point. The point here is the fact that the, the UK, Boris Johnson, has, has tried to uh, characterise the negotiations as between sovereign equals. Now, that is just a lie, because Britain and the EU are not equals. For one thing, the European Union has over 400 million people in it and consists of 27 countries, not four. So, by any stretch of the imagination, they're certainly not equals. And the European Union, if there is a no deal, uh, the countries of the European Union will suffer far less than the United Kingdom will. Um, according to reports that I've seen, um, for example, France <coughs> is projected to lose approximately 6% of its GDP as a result of a no deal Brexit. Whereas Britain, on the other hand, the figure is more like 20 to 40%, depending on how bad it is. So Britain is going to suffer far more from an odio Brexit than Europe will. And Europe knows this, Britain knows this, and you'll know that Boris Johnson made a key concession last weekend, having resisted uh, for months, for years, making any concessions to the EU. They were forced to finally concede that there will need to be uh, the right of the European Union to take unilateral action if the UK decides to... Um, change the rules. In other words, if it decides to lower its standards or if it decides, for example, to give more state aid to its industries, making them more competitive and cheaper than those on the continent, that the European Union should be entitled to impose tariffs on the goods that those companies produce. Now, this has now been conceded by Boris Johnson. So basically what's happened now is the level playing field, this is the idea that Neither, uh, no, no uh, companies in the EU or the UK should be advantaged or disadvantaged by Britain leaving means that the UK cannot now carry on with its uh, objective, the objective which I believe it's had from the beginning, which was to separate itself from the European Union completely with a hard no deal Brexit and then become a competitor. In other words, trading against the companies in the European Union, working against the interests of the European market. Now, that cannot happen. The one biggest advantage, the biggest asset that the European Union has of all the, 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 the assets it has is its internal market, which is roughly the same size as the market of uh, North America and China. So it is a gigantic market. There is absolutely no way that the European Union is going to give Britain a good deal showing that other members of the European Union could leave the, the European Union and get just the same amount of, uh, of benefits as the UK has. That's not going to happen. So the European Union will make the rules and the British government will have to obey them, despite all of the bluster. It's got to the point now where the Brexiteers have started to resort to insults. They've started to resort to rhetoric and jingoism. We've heard screaming headlines sending in the gunboats to protect our plucky, brave British fishermen. Now, what will happen if gunboats are sent in to confront, say, French fishing uh, vessels is that 
there will be a non-military response from the EU to that military intervention, which is going to be a ban on fish stocks coming from the UK into the European Union. So all that will happen if they send gunboats in is the fishing industry will collapse in the UK because they won't be able to sell their fish on the continent. All of these things have been true from the beginning. And yet Boris Johnson is still claiming that Britain is equal to the EU uh, and that gunboats are somehow going to make it possible for them to keep the pesky foreigners out of our fishing waters. It's not going to happen that way. And uh, there will be fishing concessions as well because the EU is going to demand them and it's going to demand that there will be a structure to it so that even if British boats are given more quotas, that it happens over a period of time. There's a, a kind of transition from Britain having... I can't remember what it was, 60% of the catch quotas uh, to, say, 90%. But whatever is agreed, the European Union just wants it to happen more slowly, which isn't uh, necessarily an unreasonable thing to ask. But it doesn't matter what the UK does, because one fundamental thing has gone wrong with the master plan. The master plan was that Boris Johnson was going to do a deal with Donald Trump. Donald Trump yesterday was booted out of office finally, uh, and Joe Biden has been formally um, adopted as the American president. And there is no way that Biden is going to do a deal with Britain if it isolates itself from Europe with no deal, because America needs to deal with Europe as well. And the last thing they want to do is to piss off the Europeans before they try to do a transatlantic trade deal with Europe. And uh, the Americans have always said that, that they would never, and Biden has said uh, specifically, that he would never do a trade deal with the United Kingdom that put the Good Friday Agreement in jeopardy. Now, at the moment, the Good Friday Agreement looks like it might be saved that there have been separate negotiations which look like they're going to secure the future of the island of Ireland peacefully, but they depend on the rest of the negotiations going well and an agreement being signed on trade because the two things are linked together. The agreement on Northern Ireland and the, the lack of a border across the island were part of the divorce settlement, and that much, I think, has already been settled. But until everything is settled... Nothing is settled. And we now know that Boris Johnson cannot rely on the United Kingdom to come riding over the horizon with a trade deal to rescue the UK once it's isolated itself from Europe. The whole plan, basically, uh, has gone belly up because all of the, the major ingredients which were going to make it work have now uh, basically just destroyed themselves. And we've got Trump out of office, we've got Joe Biden in office, who is not by any stretch of the imagination a big fan of Boris Johnson. He's not going to be keen to give Britain a huge wonderful trade deal to get it out of the trouble that it's dug itself into. So all of this is saying basically in the uh, Financial Times piece today, that Britain will have to sign a trade deal on the terms dictated by the European Union, because simply put, it doesn't have any choice. And no matter what spin is put on this, and no matter how long it takes, and it could take all the way up to New Year to get this done, it may even go beyond that, um, we will have all of the disadvantages of being isolated from Europe and none of the advantages, because the advantages were going to come from America and they are not coming now. The cavalry is now not going to ride over the horizon to Boris's aid. So any dreams he had of being part of a, a Western, uh, white, middle-class sort of coalition with the United States are gone. There's not going to be this English-speaking Western uh, kind of uh, block, including the United Kingdom and perhaps Australia and uh, New Zealand and Canada and North America. They're not going to do it. The Canadians are not interested either, incidentally. Neither is Australia and neither is New Zealand. None of them are interested in doing some kind of collective deal with the UK. None of it's going to happen. So what will happen, according to the FT, and I tend to agree with this, is that there will be a very poor trade deal signed, which will bind the United Kingdom to obey the European Union's rules of trade forever. So we will effectively have no change to the rules that we have to follow for the next dozen or so uh, years, at least, maybe longer. Um, but we will lose all the advantages of being a member of the European Union by coming out. We won't be able to affect any of the, the legislation. We won't be able to affect the rules. We'll only be able to mirror them on our side of the English Channel. And that leaves Britain in a situation where 
its trade is going to be more costly, much slower. There's going to be customs checks, customs barriers. There's the expense of hiring 50,000 customs officers, building new infrastructure, all the delays in the supply chain, the car manufacturers moving out because they can't operate their um, uh, their supply chain systems in such a long time frame. All of this will happen anyway. And the end result will be Britain semi-isolated, still following the rules, with none of the advantages of trading into Europe, but all of the costs. And that's where it's going to take us. Now, the second part of this programme, I wanted to talk a little bit about the polls. The poll that came out from Servation yesterday showed that the support for independence in Scotland was at 52%, and everybody was basically uh, lauding the fact that we've got a 16th poll in a row which shows support for independence. But somebody was pointing out today, and I think it's right to remember this, is that for the last three or four polls, the support for independence has been gradually reducing. It's reduced from a high point of 58% uh, in the late summer months down from 58 to 52% in this latest poll. So it has fallen back a little bit. We have to ask ourselves why that is. Now, is it because support has actually dropped or is it because the polling companies are wanting to tell something else? I think perhaps it's a little bit of both because the Scottish Government and the SNP particularly is not making any moves yet about independence. It's made some noises about it, but we still don't have a date. We don't have a question. Uh, we have an election coming up. The battle to win that election hasn't started yet. And the problem, I think, at the moment is people are weary. They're weary of not hearing anything. They're worried the daily onslaught of Scotland bad stories is continuing yesterday and today with more uh, <laughs> more figures shouted out at the, by the BBC um, saying that Scotland, despite being such a small country, has the highest drug death anywhere in the world. That might be true, I don't know, but the point is that it's making people feel depressed. It's making people feel hopeless, and of course that is what it's designed to do. Having polls like this, which gradually reduce from a high point of 58 down to 52, maybe down to 50, these are also designed to do the same thing. Remember, the polls can be manipulated a bit quite easily, depending on which company has commissioned the pollster and what exactly they want that poll to show. Now, I'm not saying that the polls are fixed, but they can be massaged, and it's quite possible by asking particular types of questions to get different results. And it might well be that the Servation poll is a blip. It could be that it's an outlier. But now we've had about three polls showing that independent support has dropped back by 6% in total. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. There is also the question of why is the SNP not pushing independence harder than it is at the moment? Why is it not doing that just now? And is that the reason why support is waning a little bit? Are people just tired of not hearing anything and are losing the will to um, to keep fighting for independence? I don't know. Uh, but it is a worrying trend. And if it starts to drop again in the next couple of polls, I wouldn't be surprised, um, partly because I think people are suffering from a kind of um, fatigue, a kind of referendum fatigue, that the referendum is never coming uh, and that there are too many negatives and there is not enough um, morale amongst the support at the moment to keep that uh, support buoyed up. The SNP has been quite, I was going to say lukewarm, lukewarm about the fact that they had this huge poll lead uh, and that they were looking like they were going to sweep 70 seats in the next election. But if this support keeps falling back the way it is, there is a chance that that might not happen. And that's something we can't afford to let go. If this poll is true, and if all of these polls and the trend is that it's gone down again, we need to make sure it goes back up again. And that means we need to keep the faith and not just faith. We need to keep pushing our politicians to move the process on. Brexit will follow its own weary route down the road I've just described earlier on until we get a watered-down trade deal where we're taking all the rules from Europe and we are in exactly the same position in terms of taking rules as we were before Brexit, except that we have to bear the billions and billions of pounds that it's going to cost the economy in jobs, in lost factories, uh, in lost employment, in lost exports. Uh, and the vast increases in prices that will come with tariffs if Britain dares to do anything to undermine this new agreement. So 
if we're relying on Brexit to be the, the thing which forces people towards independence, that may have reached its high watermark now. And I think perhaps the threat of Brexit, the threat of no deal, might start to recede now as we go gradually, stumblingly forward towards some kind of cobbled together trade deal. That people will just be relieved to have that at the end of the year. And their, um, their fear of no deal Brexit might diminish somewhat. So we can't rely on Brexit as the motivator for independence. We have to start pushing the case for it, the positive case for it. And unless we start doing that now, we might not be able to reverse that trend. So it's vital that all of the political parties that are in favour of independence now start putting out positive messages about the fight to get independence, to get that referendum done, to win it, and to get out of the situation that we're in. The, the low deal Brexit, which looks like it might be the, the thing that's going to happen, is going to be almost as bad as no deal. Because um, despite being out of the European Union, we will still have to abide by their rules in order to trade with them. But we'll bear the costs of all the customs checks and the delays and the loss of business. So it's still going to be bad. But like I say, you cannot rely on just fear of Brexit to drive the movement for independence and the support for it upwards. We need far more than that. And with this slight drop in the polls, okay, it's 6%, but 6% is a lot. We've got used to being in the lead by a long way, but to see it slightly falling back each month, each next poll comes down a little bit lower, that's alarming. That trend has to be arrested now. And I think the only way to do that is to start fighting the independence referendum before we even get to the ballot box next year. I have a strong suspicion, and I have seen columnists uh, like, for example, uh, We Ginger Dog, like Paul, um, uh, Paul, <laughs> I've forgotten his name for a minute, but you're all Paul anyway. Um, but Paul has, uh, Paul Cavanaugh, Morrison, I beg your pardon, my memory for names is not that great. But even Paul has suggested that if the, the British government stands in the way of um, a plebiscite, in the way of a referendum, that we should have a plebiscite, re a plebiscite election next year, because if that's going to be the case, we cannot take any of these um, other plans off the table. We can't afford to uh, ignore anything. And Mike Russell has already acknowledged that fact. This is going to be a difficult fight. The British government will put every obstacle they can in the way. We've had um, uh, Ross Davidson saying, Ross Davidson, pardon, beg your pardon. Uh, Anyway, with the Tory leader, I'm getting it mixed up as well with Ruth Davidson now. Um, anyway, we have had, uh, sorry, Douglas Ross, I beg your pardon, we've had Douglas Ross saying that the Tories will boycott any independence referendum. But their support is so small, 22%, it wouldn't make any difference as long as everybody who's for independence turns up. Um, Woody Allen once said that history is written by those who bother to turn up. And in the case of the Scottish independence referendum, that will be true, because even if the Tories ignore it and tell their supporters to stay at home and not vote, we will still win it. But not only that, but if we have a turnout of, say, two and a half million people who all vote for independence, that's a majority, even without the Tories turning up to actually vote. If they turned up to vote, they would still lose. If they don't vote, they still lose, because you can prove that a majority of those people registered on the electoral register have voted yes. So it doesn't matter what the Tories do, we still win it. But the important point I'm trying to make here today is that it's not going to win itself. Brexit is not going to drive us to independence. Brexit has taken us to the point where our support has risen to as much as 58%. But now that high water mark is receding. And this is where we need to take up the cudgels. This is where we need to start the fight for independence and stop relying on the Tories to do our job for us. They've got to the end of their road with Brexit. We know what that's going to be now. It's going to be a low, low deal where Britain is disadvantaged, isolated, there's no trade deal with America and is having to obey the rules of the European Union without being able to affect them. That's still a bad deal. We're still going to be hit badly by this, but it's not enough to win independence. We need to make the case. We need to make the case for the currency, for the central bank. We need to make the case for some way of trading with Europe after we've become independent, whatever that is. All of these things need to start now. Anyway, that's it for me today. But it's time that we woke up and started fighting. 
the SNP has relied for too long on Boris Johnson to do the work of pushing people towards independence. Yes, it's done that, but now it's starting to wane. The effect of it is wearing off. As we get closer and closer to a trade deal, people start to switch off. And we can't afford them to do that. We need to keep reminding them the Brexit is still going to be terrible. But at the same time, we have to show them, on the other hand, the bright future that lies ahead with independence. If we don't do both, then support will drop back. Now's the time to start working, folks. See you later. Bye.